Quote, when most adventurers think of enormous reptilian beasts, dragons immediately come to mind. However, dragons are not the only scaled giants to instigate fear, respect, and sheer awe with their mere presence. One such magical beast combines the veracity of an entire pack of starving predators with unchecked draconic deadliness. The Bahir. Bestial yet canny predators, behirs prowl broken hills, wastelands and barrens looking for food enough to fill their considerable gullets. With surprising cunning disguised by their monstrous appearance, behirs offer those expecting to face nothing more than a dumb beast, only a slow and painful digestion." End quote. Before we start, as always, let's go and see what the monster manual says about the creature. It says that a Bahir's monstrous form resembles a combination of centipede and crocodile. Its scaled hide ranges from ultramarine to deep blue in color, fading to a pale blue on its underside. And that's all the description we get, alongside, of course, a picture to go with it. It says here that they make their lairs in inaccessible places, favoring locations where would-be intruders would have to make a harrowing climb to reach them. Further down, it says that a Bahir's dozen legs allows it to scramble through its lair site with ease. When not climbing, it moves even faster by folding its legs beside its body and then slithering like a snake. In here it says that they swallow their prey whole, after which they enter a period of dormancy while they digest. It, it makes sense then why they would pick such a hard place for enemies to reach, if they then become dormant and lethargic after eating. It's interesting though that down here we actually get an answer to a very old question. Bahiris have always had a strong hatred for dragons, a hatred that for the most part was not answered until now. It says here that in times long forgotten, giants and dragons engaged in seemingly an endless war. Storm giants created the first Bahirs as weapons against the dragons, and Bahirs retain a natural hatred for them. That hatred is further explained down here where it says that they never make their lair in an area it knows to be inhabited by a dragon. If a dragon comes close, the Bahir is compelled to kill it or drive it off. Only if the dragon proves too powerful to fight does the Bahir back down, seeking out a new lair a great distance away. So there's that. In here we get the stat sheet, incredibly fast creatures with an incredible 50 feet of speed alongside 40 feet of climbing speed, which is also really good. Very high perception and stealth, immunity to lightning obviously, dark vision and interestingly enough an ability to speak. As far as attacks go, it can bite really hard. It can constrict like a snake, dealing bludgeoning and slashing damage. It has a really powerful lightning breath attack that is equal in power to an adult blue dragon's. And it can also swallow its star get a hole, which it makes sense considering that it is not merely a large creature, but a huge creature. But there you have it, the fifth edition entry to the Bahir. Now let's go ahead and talk about what the monster manual does not tell you about this monster. The first thing that I want to touch on is actually the description of the creature because we don't really get one, at least not a real description. All we got was that it was a mixture between a centipede and a crocodile and then the color of its hide. And this is a problem that the 5th edition monster manual suffers from typically which is that there's just not enough space for a real thorough description. If we got one for each monster, we would have to double the size of the book, which just wouldn't do. And that's why they rely almost entirely on pictures to show how the monster is supposed to look, and normally this is fine. Most people will already know how the monsters look, and those who don't can just simply see the picture. The problem happens when the picture does not accurately tell how the monster is actually supposed to look. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, well, it's just sad. It's particularly sad because this art is quality. I mean, the monster in here looks awesome. The thing is, if you were an adventurer in looks for a quest, and you approached a farming community with a Bahir problem, let's say that a Bahir has been eating farmers up in the hills. If you were to ask them, hey, uh, how does the monster look so I can go hunt it? They would tell you that the monster looks like a dragon without wings and with many legs. A particularly savvy person might say that it looks like a blue dragon without wings and many legs. That would be the description that any particular random person would give you if they were to see a Bahir. 
this doesn't look like a dragon at all. Mainly because for some reason it's missing the banded scales. See, this is how a Behir is actually supposed to look like and now you can see what I mean. A person could mistake this for a wingless dragon. You can also note that the horns are very different as well, with the 5th edition rendition having what appears to be ram horns. The Behir does not use their horns for attacking at all, or for ramming for that matter. Instead, they actually use their horns for preening, cleaning, and scratching their back in hard to reach places. Not something that you could do with these type of horns. See, it all comes down to the creature concepts for 5th edition made by Bryn Metheny, a phenomenal artist, by the way. He wrote in his blog, quote, In October of 2013, I was approached by Wizards of the Coast to redesign a variety of classic monsters for the newest incarnation of Dungeons & Dragons, end quote. The word redesign, I suppose, suggests that the change was purposefully. Ironically, I personally do prefer the new design. It, it feels more unique, like it stands out by itself rather than just being something that looks like a dragon. But part of me is obviously sad that they would try and go for a change. In any case, I will give you the description as to how the creature is actually supposed to look like. Quote, a Behir is unmistakable to the learned, once you have seen it. It is a twelve-legged serpent, with each foot bearing three toes that end in razor-sharp talons. These talons are hooked like a raptor's, but are designed for slashing, not for grasping prey. The body is covered in band-like scales from light to dark blue in color, with grayish tints along the edges. The underside is also light blue and composed of a vertical row of banded scales. The upper scales are very hard and tough, and if treated correctly, can be made into serviceable armor. The head is long and the narrow mouth is filled with many sharp teeth. Two backward curving horns project from the rear of the skull, each black in color and three to four feet in length." End quote. The teeth of the creature are described as needle-like and specifically pointing inward towards the inside of the mouth. See, Behirs can't actually chew their food. They only ever swallow their prey whole, and if they cannot swallow it whole for some reason, they simply spit it out. Because they swallow their prey whole, their stomach acid is meant to be extraordinarily powerful. Acid that gets spooned into the stomach as soon as something arrives. The acid is so strong that it has the capabilities of completely dismantling and corroding even metal. Metal which is actually crucial to the correct functioning of the creature, so you could even go so far as to say that metal is actually part of the nutritional requirements of the Behir, but we will cover that later on. In any case, the acid is powerful enough to corrode metal in a few days and flesh and bone in merely a few minutes. However, the acid is not strong enough to dissolve gems or glass, and these are sometimes found inside of the stomach and actually comprise the only treasure that the creature ever possesses. So if you're an adventurer and you kill a Behir and try and find its hoard, you should always try looking into the stomach. This is Adventuring 101, fellas. Every time you see a monster that swallows their prey whole, always check the stomach. What's particularly interesting though that the 5th edition monster manual left out is that Behirs are actually immune to poison. At least certain kinds of poison. See, the stomach acid is so strong, it actually destroys ingested poisons, which is interesting. In Dungeon Magazine number 156, under the article Ecology of the Bahir, we describe the story of a sage and explorer who actively tries to capture the creature and attempts to do so by leaving a carcass on the ground that has been filled with poison. The explorer is attempting to poison the Behir so as to study it, but he goes on to describe how it didn't matter how much poison he used, the Behir seemingly was impervious to it. Furthermore, he attempted to use poisoned darts on the creature, all of which were also useless. Upon further investigation, it was revealed that in between the big armored plates of the creature, there are these huge layers of fat. Fat that provides a wall preventing intoxicants from entering the bloodstream. This means that the Behir cannot be injected with any substance, as the substance will not enter the bloodstream and instead will simply get stuck in the fat. I'm not sure if this makes any medical sense, this is just the lore that is written about the creature. In any case, this is why in 1st and 2nd edition monster manuals, the Behir is described as being immune to poison. 
Both Bahir entries in the Dragon magazines also confirm this. See, this is one of my favorite things about Dungeons and Dragons lore. You find many times that a monster is immune to a very specific ailment or type of attack, and oftentimes it is very easy to attribute its immunity or resistance to magic. Oh yeah, the creature cannot be charmed, it's just... It just has a magical protection against it, when in reality oftentimes there's an interesting biological reason why those immunities exist, reasons actually explained in the lore. I, I love it. The Bahir is also described as being immune to being tripped and proned, which makes sense considering that it does have 12 legs and the ability to slither gracefully through harsh terrain, but that's, that's more of a common sense thing. Also, now that we're speaking about the legs, in the monster sheet under the ability Constrict, you can see that it does both bludgeoning and slashing. The slashing comes from the legs as it tries to scratch you, kind of like how a cat will grapple you and then scratch you. I know it is obvious that the slashing comes from the legs, but it was not described in the tooltip, so I figure I would. The lore states that the Bahir cannot use their claws, though, for attacks unless they have a creature grappled. They just don't have the necessary muscle function for a good slashing attack otherwise. Anyways, so far we have talked about the stuff that specifically conflicted with the 5th edition entry. Now let's just talk about the Bahir. What is a Bahir? How does it work? How does it think? What does it do all day? Let's get into it. First of all, Bahirs are active during the day and sleep during the night. This is not always the case, but it is 99% of the time. That is because Bahirs share many features of reptiles, one of which is its cold-blooded body. Bahirs need the sun to get energy and they become incredibly sluggish during the night. Quote, because of their reptilian nature, Bahirs become extremely sluggish when temperatures fall below the freezing point, especially if the weather is cloudy. Thus, cold-producing spells such as Cone of Cold and Ice Storm reduce a Bahir's movement by half for 2-8 to eight rounds. If the low temperature can somehow be maintained, the Bahir will go nearly dormant, seeking only to defend itself from attack and escape the cold by whatever means possible." End quote. When it comes to prey, they are carnivorous and they can eat basically anything thanks to their powerful stomach acids. Their favorite food tends to be medium to large mammals like boars, though they are perfectly fine snacking on humans, elves, or even ogres. Their appetite is said to be quite large when they are hungry, being able to eat multiple large creatures in a single eating rampage. They can't have too many individuals being swallowed up at the same time, but during a whole day eating spree, well, they are quite voracious. The downside is though that, like many reptiles, once they have had their fill, Bahirs are forced to spend several days actually recovering from their gluttony as they digest their meals. This is why Bahirs take great care to make their layers as high up as possible, as hidden as possible, in places where you could only ever reach if you had godlike climbing abilities. It is because the Bahir is mega sluggish during the night and because he has to recover from eating for many days at a time. Furthermore, they also hibernate during winter, eating and fattening up before the season and then sleeping it through the whole time. This is also a big reason why Bahirs prefer to hunt away from their nests and why they never bring any dead prey to their nests. They don't want the scent of the dead creature to lure any monster into their hidden lairs. Another reptilian quality they possess is the fact that they never stop growing. Hypothetically speaking, if you somehow made a Bahir immortal, it would just keep and keep and keep on growing forever. Fortunately though, for all of us, the lifespan of a Bahir is actually not that long. Most of them can only survive for up to 40 years. Some who are lucky make it to 60, but not much more than that. Typically those who make it to these ages make it to about 40 feet long on size on average, though explorers have unearthed ancient Bahir skeletons of up to 60 feet long in size. Speaking of prey, Bahirs are incredible hunters. In spite of the fact that they are not as intelligent as humans, they have incredible cunning when it comes to ambushes and hunting. This is actually where their stealth and perception proficiencies in 5th edition actually come into play. Because they're not very intelligent, their capabilities to speak is actually fairly limited. Yeah, they, they do have the ability to speak, but not all of them really do. Quote, 
The Bahir can be trained if caught within a year of their hatching. For this reason, young Bahir and Bahir eggs can be sold on the open market for 500 to 750 gold pieces. Such training takes about two months for a skilled animal trainer, after which the Bahir can understand and speak common as well as a five-year-old child could." End quote. One can imagine that with even further training you could probably increase the speaking skill somewhat, but it is very unlikely that you would ever see huge big improvements. Like with anything magical, however, there are always exceptions and in dangerous dungeons, especially those where mad magical scientists have had their way, you might find special Bahir that can speak perfectly and might even be very intelligent. If you are, however, thinking of training and befriending a Bahir, I should warn you, quote, its natural tendency towards treachery can never be removed. There is a 50% chance the Bahir will abandon its current master for a new one if approached properly. By its 10th year, a Bahir will attempt to free itself and will become unmanageable in all respects. It is possible to train Bahir if captured while only months old. Such Bahir can be taught to understand simple commands and even to speak a few words of common, but they are capricious and wicked by nature, respecting only power, and this loyalty usually lasts from one meal to the next or until a more powerful master comes along. Thus, ownership of a Bahir can be a double-edged sword. A Bahir that is much larger than its owner is certain to strike out and become unimaginable." End quote. Further, when it comes to dealing with a wild Bahir, quote, Bahirs possess the capability to negotiate but only do so if they believe that for some reason they cannot take what they desire. Those who must frequently travel through a Bahir's territory find that offering a large amount of food, such as a cow or a horse, along with a healthy amount of self-deprecating flattery, is a good way to keep a Bahir from attacking." End quote. Now, Bahirs are solitary creatures, never really communing with others of its kind except for the purpose purposes of reproduction. Mating typically takes place in early spring, with the pair choosing a secluded cave in which to live during this time. The female will lay sometimes up to eight eggs, though typically only about four of the eggs are actually viable and will yield a baby. These eggs are blue-green in color with a leathery texture to them. They are about two feet in length and will generally be buried under a light layer of sand or dirt. The time it takes for the eggs to hatch is a contested variable. Some say that they have seen the eggs hatch as soon as four weeks after being buried, while others say that it takes as long as eight months. Regardless, the mother will always stay in the lair to protect them while the male will hunt for food for the pair. After hatching, it will not take long for the parents to shoo the baby away though. It'll maybe only take them a few weeks before they use their lightning bolts to scatter the babies away before, of course, then both parents will also go into their separate ways. Quote, Parental attitudes do not last long, as the young are quickly driven from the lair after hatching and must fend for themselves. Few survive to adulthood, as any number of other monsters and foes, not the least of them being adventurers, will slay the young at any opportunity. End quote. Newly hatched baby Bahirs are about two feet long and will only possess six to eight of their legs. They actually grow the remaining legs as they grow, which they do at a rate of eight feet per year. That is eight feet in length every year that they grow, not that they grow eight legs per year. The speed of growth does severely slow down though once they start reaching their full adult size of 40 feet long and weighing over 4,000 pounds. Then it'll be fully matured by age 10, at which point it'll be ready to mate on its own. You can actually tell how old a Bahir is by how long the horns are, which is the metric that sages in D&D use to gauge that sort of thing. Now lastly, let's talk about the electrical capabilities of the creature. Uh, how exactly does it work? In the fictional book Creatures of the Wilderlands, written by the fictional character the sage Radamus, he described his theories on how the creature produced electricity. He did experiments on Bahirs by studying a dead one and seeing how his organs functioned. Quote, the most dangerous aspect of the Bahir, however, is the ability to generate a bolt of lightning, perhaps in the same manner as a blue dragon. This bolt is roughly seven yards long and is directed from its mouth. 
Upon studying the remains of the Bahir, I finally managed to obtain, I have discovered a few clues to how this might be done, but nothing conclusive. A large organ with an unusually high concentration of metals lie adjacent to the stomach. This organ is connected by a system of nerve structures to another, smaller organ in the back of the mouth. Again, this smaller organ has a high concentration of metals. The hypothesis is that an electrical current is produced in the larger gland by some as of yet unknown method, then stored in the smaller gland until discharged. The Bahir seems to have complete control over this ability and is able to fire this bolt as often as five or six times per hour. Perhaps to supply these organs, Bahir ingest fairly large quantities of metal, preferring copper and silver over all others. Few items of metallic nature are found after a Bahir has slain a victim. Occasionally, a Bahir can be distracted by a great amount of copper or silver coins, allowing passage or not attacking. But only if the Bahir is well fed beforehand. The high metal content in the Bahir's bodily system seems to have an added advantage in that they are themselves unaffected by electrical discharges in any form. Exactly how the Bahir uses the metal it eats or how it is involved in the generation of and resistance to the lightning is unknown, but I plan to continue my research into this interesting phenomena." End quote. It is interesting though that the mechanism on the lightning creation of the Bahir was further explored in a different place in Dragon Magazine number 333. It's an entirely different article, but they further explained how it works, and it said this, quote, a portion of the energy Bahirs generate from their food goes to fueling a number of strange, almost glassy organs that run below the thickly armored plates of their necks. Far different from the Draconis Fundamentum organ that produces the breath weapon of true dragons, these coarse formations are arranged in a state of constant friction, shifting and colliding against one another as the Bahir moves. This constant friction gathers with several chambers in inside the Bahir, waiting to escape in a bolt when the creature opens a specialized chamber within its mouth. Sometimes this energy escapes in ribbons that ripple over a Bahir's tongue or crackle over its spines, especially when the creature becomes agitated or otherwise excited. These formations require almost exactly one minute to generate enough friction to create a blast of electricity deadly enough for a Bahir to use as a weapon." End quote. The reason that it specifies that it takes exactly one minute for the mechanism to generate the required electricity for the attack is because the Bahir has actually always needed a full 10 rounds for it to be able to recharge its lightning bolt ability. In first edition, it required 10 minutes to use the ability again after being used, and same in second edition, and then once again in third. It actually wasn't until fifth edition where they revamped the ability for powers to recharge using a d6 roll at every round. It's also very interesting though that this electrical circuit that runs throughout the body of the Bahir does more than simply be a format for the creature to produce blasts of lightning. In fact, the reason the Bahir behaves the way it does is because this circuit is in there. In fact, most of the way you should roleplay the beast, the beast will completely change thanks to this understanding of the creature. See, the charged structures in the body of the Bahir are actually not too far from the creature's brain, especially the organ that holds most of the electricity near the mouth. The lore describes that because the brain is so close to this organ, the creature suffers violent mood swings, far-flung leaps of reasoning, and spasmodic muscle actions, since the brain is constantly being jolted with constant bolts of electricity. Furthermore, it is also the reason why Bahirs live fast and burn out quickly, rarely living more than 40 years. That's thanks to the electricity that constantly runs uncontrolled within their bodies that actually harms them. Because of the inherent magic of their body though and their strange apparent creation by the storm giants, it is possible to see extreme variations in this though. You do see many, in fact most Bahirs dying of old age at age 40, but some have been seen to last hundreds of years. 
To add to this, external sources of electricity excite them, almost like a pump of energy in their bodies. Because of this, they relish roaming or climbing to the peaks of high mountains amid thunderstorms, in the hopes of being blasted by lightning. Those that haven't had the chance to mate by spring end up mating by the hottest days of summer thanks to these thunderstorms. Quote, During such times, the swift popping bellows of Behir mating cries mingle with regular crashes of thunder. Travelers should be extremely wary of wandering through an agitated Bahir's territory during this time of year, and especially in the middle of such a storm. End quote. You do not want to find a group of Bahir mating, trust me. Now, to finish up the video, let's talk gold. What can an adventurer or society in general get out of a Bahir? Well, I already mentioned before that a Bahir egg or a baby Bahir can go for 500 to 750 gold pieces, but different pieces of the creature can also be individually valuable. Armorers and smith would pay from 500 gold pieces to even 1,000 gold pieces for a fully grown Bahir's hide in good condition. That's because one can actually make beautifully banded mail with it. It doesn't have any special properties other than being just extremely luxurious as the colors of the Bahir are actually quite unique. It does take, however, two to four weeks to construct such an armor, and it costs an average of 2,000 gold pieces to make it in total. One can make up to three man-sized armors like this with the height of a single slain Bahir. You can also create various useful inks for scrolls using the body of the creature. The horns of the Vahir can be used to brew the ink for the popular lightning bolt scroll. You can use the sharp talons to make the ink for a neutralized poison scroll. And lastly, you can use the heart of the Vahir to make the ink for a protection from poison scroll. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Walker Motley, Zach Bowell, Rocato Fan, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doug Feeder, Terry Culp, Baracus Law, Omega Scales, Karathas the Bulwark, Ozol, Soundtech, Ziri, Alex Cookson, Square Chicken, Ariel Nelson, Benjamin Bosters, IO is Awesome, Falky951, Jacob Krasit, Griffin Pierce, Xeron King, Brad Salazar, Sabine Kurjab, Solorensis, Sean Reynolds, Tesla Coil, Michael S, William Sladden, Drayden, Troll Skull Dude, Mr. Salty, Adam A, Silent Shopper, The Role Playing Junkies, Thomas Hunt, and Jericho Darkstar for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Mr. Rex to support. I actually do want to mention as well uh, a really big thank you to my $10 patron supporters for actually voting on what type of video I was going to make and they voted on our monster videos. So I'm going to be spending probably the next three or four videos, maybe even five videos on just talking about monsters, talking about what they don't tell you about a plethora of different monsters in the monster manual. So a big thank you to them as well. And with that said, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much all of you for, for supporting me on Patreon and for just watching the video and liking and commenting. I appreciate it all. I obviously really, really do. And I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.